Uh, I, I do believe I have a, a word that, that uh, will, will challenge us. It's, it's something that, it's a personal word. There's sermons that you study and you pray and God gives you a word. And there's, stu- there's sermons that you study, pray, and it's through personal experience that God gives you a word. And so this morning, that's one of those. It's a sermon of, of study and prayer and personal experience. I want to talk to you today uh, from the book of Genesis, Genesis 32, uh, 22 through 31. I want to talk to you today about Jacob. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the book of Genesis. And sometimes we think of Genesis just as the creation story. That's great. I love the creation story. But I also love to see the, the, the stories of the patriarchs and how God established his people and how these ordinary men were called by God and, and called to begin uh, a, a nation set apart to serve the Lord. So we see Abraham, we see Isaac, we see Jacob. I love to study Joseph. He's one of my favorite characters. But this morning, we're going to look at Jacob, and we're going to look at his encounter with God. So let's read Genesis 32, 22 through 31. And he, Jacob, arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent, them, sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, I say that as a southerner. I wrestled. Okay. It's a, so if you say wrestling in the south, you don't put a G on it. It's wrestling. Okay. So he wrestled uh, uh, until the breaking of the day. Now, when he saw that, uh, he did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And that's kind of our pivotal point this morning that we're going to talk about. I will not let you go until you bless me. Verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Verse 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, what is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So he called the place, the name of the place, Peniel. For I've seen God's, the face of God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, we thank you for uh, just your faithfulness and your goodness. And Lord, I pray today that, that you would speak to us through your word. God, that's all that matters is that we hear your word. God, that we, we are open and, and receptive to, to what you have to say. Lord, we, we have felt your spirit. We know you are here. There's no doubt that your spirit is in this place. Lord, move, speak, have your way, change us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Now, if you know anything about Jacob, he was quite a character. Jacob, um, you know, so, some kids, they start out, and we call them characters. Well, he's a little character. Well, that's what Jacob was, and I don't want to establish kind of what his name means and who he was from birth. Now, Genesis 25 and 26, this is the account of the birth of Jacob. It says, after his brother, that was Esau, came out, and his hand took hold of es- Jacob's hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. And the name Jacob means to grasp the heel, which is a figure of speech meaning to deceive. So his name means deceiver. And how would you like to have that name? As you know, you're, you're being born. You grab your brother's heel. You come out. Well, I think we'll call him Jacob. He's a deceiver. In your whole life. You know, names are important, and we're going to talk about names in a little bit in in this message. You know, names are very important. And so his whole life, he was called deceiver, 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 deceiver. You know what? He lived up to his name because he did a good job of it. And, And we see 
uh, and again, we don't have time to go through all this. That's why I encourage you to read Genesis. There, there's such wonderful stories and narratives of, of how God moves and what God does. But we see in Jacob's life that he lives up to his name of deceiver, a, a trickster. Uh, and, and we know the story of how he, he uh, kind of tricks Esau out of the birthright. We know the story of how he tricks his dad into blessing him. You know, he puts the, 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 the animal skin on and they, they cook the meal and he, he's got Esau's clothes on and he goes into dad and dad and, and, and he gets blessed. And so he's quite a character and, and quite a trickster. Now the thing, the problem is with that is, is that when you do that to people, people don't always appreciate that. And so his brother Esau is, is you know, you say sometimes, I'm going to kill that person. But you don't really, nobody really means it. Esau was like, I'm going to kill him, and I really mean it. And so Jacob understands that, that he has tricked Esau out of the birthright and the blessing. He has tricked his father. And his mom had a little bit to play with that too, so, so we have to blame a little bit on the mom. He was a mom. Was, Esau was the man of the field. I mean, Esau was the tough guy. You know, he, he had the four-wheel drive truck and the guns, and he was hunting. You know, he, could have been a he could have been a Texan. Now I think about it. He'd have gone out there and he's killing stuff and cooking it up. And then Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. He was at home. And, and so mom kind of helped him out to trick and to get the blessing. And so we kind of establish in his life this pattern of tricking people. And so Jacob realizes, hey, it's not good to be here. My brother wants to kill me. Uh, his parents say, you, you, you probably need to leave. So he goes and, and lives with his uncle Laban, his mother's brother. And so the thing is, he finds, uh, he meets his match in Laban. And basically for 20 years, Laban tricks Jacob. And so he lives this, this life of being tricked and tricking and this deceit and all this. And, and again, I... I I find humor in different ways in the Bible. And my thing with Jacob is he goes, he lives with Laban. He falls in love with Rachel. Rachel's the, I'm going to work for seven years. I'm going to do anything I can, Laban, for Rachel. And then, Jacob, how do you marry the wrong woman? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, how does that happen? It tr tricked again. Anyway, he spends 20 years with Laban. And this passage of scripture that we just read, this is, this is when Jacob is taking his family back to his homeland. This is, he's left, he's tricked Laban, he's left, he's on his way back home. And a lot happened in that 20 years. There was a lot of things that went on. And so we, we look at this as, as he's at this place of returning back home. And there's this uncertain future that, that is before him. He's got this kind of shaky past. He's got all these things that have happened. And then the, he's at this place. And there's an uncertain future before him. Let's look at Genesis 32 and verse 22. It says, And he, Jacob, arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and cross over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, set them over the brook, and set over what he had. And we're going to spend a, just a, a few minutes looking at this place called Jabbok. We're going to do a little word study and see what all that means. But Jacob is at this place, and, and this is a, another thing I find humor. Here's Jacob. He has, at this point, wives and kids, a lot of stuff, he knows, if you read earlier in the passage, he knows that Esau is coming with 400 men. He's at this place of decision, this place of crossing over. And what does he do? He says, wives and kids, y'all go first. I'll be behind you. You ever know people that when they say they're going to be behind you, they really mean they're going to be behind you? So he sends his, I mean, he knows his brother's coming with 400 men. And so he sends his wives and kids over, all his stuff is over, and the scene is set that is, that is him by himself. 
a jabok. Now, one thing about uh, especially some of the Old Testament words, names of places, they sound odd to us. But there's a lot of meaning behind it. Just, just like Jacob, the name Jacob had a lot of meaning. The word jabok has a lot of meaning. And in the Hebrew, we see some wordplay in the passage of Scripture here. But Jabbok, the Jabbok River is, is a major tributary of the Jordan. And it's located east of the Jordan. But listen to this. Jabbok means pouring forth. It also implies emptied struggle or passing over. Pouring forth, emptied struggle or passing over. So Jacob is alone at Jabbok. And so this is a place where he is emptied in a place of self-surrender. Because there's going to be a powerful encounter here with God. Now, up until this point, Jacob had relied on himself and not so much God. He had encountered God, but he was a trickster. He, He was the one manipulating. He was trying to make all the moves. And he is at this place as he, he has left Laban behind. He has left these 20 years of, of struggle and toil behind. He has come to this place. He has sent his family over. And here he stands at Jabbok at night by himself. And it's a place of surrender, of emptying oneself out, of, of, of just, I'm at the crossroads. I'm at the place. And I find myself in life uh, too often being self-sufficient. Can we be honest? Sometimes we're so self It's not that we don't love the Lord. It's not that we don't serve the Lord. But we've tried in our own way to make things happen. Can anybody relate to that this morning? I mean, I've served the Lord my whole life. But I can look back at so many times where I tried to make it. I tried to figure it out. I tried to make it happen. It didn't work. You know, I'm like, oh, well, I figured it out. It's supposed to work. And that's, that was Jacob's past. And now he stands at the Jabbok. His self-sufficiency had brought him to this place. His self-sufficiency had brought much conflict. And here he is at Jabbok. And Jabbok is where God deals with us, not only about our sin, but about our character. Now, let, me, let me just say this. Jabbok... Is, is a very important place. Jabbok is a place of change. It's a place where we know that there's no turning back, that as we move ahead, there's an uncertain future. And I just feel like for us as a church and as a people, 2020 uh, did a lot of things. It, it kind of refocused us. And if we look back... You know, we all, we're, we're, no matter how good you are, there, there, there's pros and cons to your past. There's good and bad. There, there's areas that we've fallen. There's, there's, there's things that we've done. We, we don't go back to that. And we stand at a place and make a decision about moving forward. So that's, where, that's what Jabbok is. It's this place of God. I've, I've tried it my own way. God, I've, I've done everything I know how to do. I've encountered you, I've served you in in certain ways, but now we're at Jabbok. Now we're at this very important, pivotal place, a place of of pouring ourselves out, a place of self-surrender, a place of emptying oneself. And I wrote down these things, uh, what Jabbok kind of means and what it is. It's a place of divine encounter. Jabbok is a place of new beginnings. It's a crossroad. It's a place of struggle and contention. It's a place of crossing over. It's a place of brokenness. Jabbok is a place of stretching and transition. It's a place where we're forced to examine ourselves. It's the end of a chapter and beginning of another one. And this is what I love the most. Jabbok is the bridge between the pains of yesterday and the hope of tomorrow. You get that? It's a transitional place. And I just feel like coming out of 2020 and all the things that have happened, 
So many of us are at a transitional place. I feel the church is at a transitional place, that we've tried to do things a certain way. We've relied on ourselves a whole lot. And we've got to come to the place of self-surrender, a place of pouring ourselves out, a place of saying, I can't, I can't do much about the past. That's the past. I'm at the place of decision. The future is uncertain because I, I'm going to choose what's going to happen and how I'm going to respond to an encounter with God. Now, Genesis 32, 24 says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now, the Bible doesn't give much detail about where this man came from or who initiated the struggle between the two. I don't, I don't know if it was like a, a, a De Niro thing. Are you talking to me? You talking to me? You talk. I don't know how it went down. You know, what are you looking at? What you doing here? The Bible, now th this, is, this is an amazing encounter between God and man. And this is all the Bible says. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Gives no details. Now, we want all the details. We want a Hollywood production. But, you know, none of that's really important. It said Jacob was alone, and he encountered a man. And this was, uh, again, as some people debate, it could be an angel. It could be the pre-incarnate Christ. But as you see in the passage of Scripture, they've capitalized the M and man. So it's some kind of divine encounter. So Jacob is at this lonely place of decision, and he enters into the struggle with God. And it's a prolonged struggle. And it's a battle. 25 and 26. Genesis 32, 25 and 26. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, Jacob, since, again, we have no real information about how this encounter happened or who the, if it was an angel or pre-incarnate Christ, but Jacob somehow understands this is, this is a, an encounter with God. He understands that this is something different. This, this isn't just an ordinary man. And so he grabs a hold, and this, this battle begins. And he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, what struck me is that this wasn't a bless me for a new car. Bless me, big house. You, you don't wrestle with God like that over those type of things. Right? This is a desperation. Lord, I'm here. You're here. And it's on. Bless me. And I believe the, the, the thing he was asking for was the promises of God to be fulfilled in his life. He's saying, God, I've been through all this stuff. Lord, I've, I've tricked my family and I've dealt with Uncle Laban and I've done all this, but I have a promise. You gave me a promise. And Lord, I need a breakthrough and I need change. Does anybody here this morning need a breakthrough in your life? I, could, I do. I need to break through. There's areas in my life that I need God break through. And these prayers aren't little bless me prayers. They're not God. You know, I've, I've got a nice truck. But Lord, they've got the new Chevy Texas edition. You know, Lord, bless me. Come on, Lord, bless me. Or, or Lord, we, we're in this 4,000 square foot home. And God, I don't know what we're going to do. We really need a 6,000 square foot home. Because that would be, bless me, Lord. Right? And there's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not the kind of prayer that Jacob was praying. Because Jacob already had great wealth. He had wives and children. The gifts that he, and you'll see in the story, he sends gifts before him. He, he's still trying to play the game. He's still trying to pacify Esau. 
But he sends gifts before him of, of cattle and sheep and those things that are estimated to be like a half a million dollars of value of the gifts that he sends before him. So this isn't a man asking just a little bless me. This is a desperate man who's asking God for a breakthrough and for change. And let's look at Genesis 28, 20 through 22, and see this. This is the change. This is, this is, what, this is kind of the deal that Jacob made with God when he left the first time, when he leaves to go to his uncle Laban's. And we're going to contrast that with, with, with the response he has when he returns. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Does that sound kind of familiar, right? And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And all that, I, all that you give me, I surely will give a tenth to you. Now on his way out, on his way to Laban's, this, this is his heart. It's a very, Lord, you, you get this? No, I, I know nobody here at Flag has ever prayed like this or, or been like this, but it's the, Lord, I'll serve you if, let's see, if you, if you keep me safe, if you give me bread to eat, if you give me clothes, if you do all the stuff, if you keep me in peace, God, I'll serve you. I'm your man, Lord. As long as you feed me, clothe me, keep me safe, give me peace, bless me in every way, I'm right here for you, Lord. I'll even do this for you, Lord. If you bless me enough, I'm going to give you the tenth because that's just the kind of guy I am. Right? Doesn't that sound so familiar? Again, I'll be very transparent before you. And it's not very, it's not very flattering. But there's times that I find myself being like that. Of God, you know, if, if you'll make everything right, Lord, if you keep me safe, you keep my family safe, you, you make life smooth, you do all these things, Lord, I'm more than willing to serve you. And I'll even throw in the 10% for you, Lord. And that was, that's Jacob as he leaves. He's a young man. He encounters God. And he makes a deal. Lord, if you do all these things for me, I got you. And it's so different as he has experienced life. As he has gone through these things. And he comes back. Now Bethel, the, the place here that he makes for God, Bethel means house of God. And so he has this, this grand encounter. And he experiences uh, God and has his revelation of, of angels going up and down the heaven. He's seen angels. He's heard from God. But at Bethel, the flesh is still in control. It's a place of religion, but not relationship and spirituality. Bethel is his place that he encounters God. But he has it changed. It's a partial revelation. It goes for the blessings while ignoring the deep inner struggle. Again, guilty. And I think that's a representation of, of much of the Western church. Is that, man, we, we love the blessing. We love to talk. We love to bless me, Lord. But how many of us are willing to have that deep inner struggle that changes us and transforms us? That's what Jabok was about. That's what Jabok was about. It's about, Lord, I'm going beyond that, and I'm coming to this place of struggle. It's an honest self-examination. I want to look at uh, Genesis 28, uh, 12 through 15. And this is, this is what the struggle was about. This is what I believe the struggle was about. It's about the promise that God had given Jacob. It says, then, then he, that means Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up 
on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there were angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood ab- above it and said, now this, is, this, is, this is the promise, this is what this is about. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall be spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. This is, this is, I believe this is the blessing. This is what Jacob is asking for. It's not more stuff. It's God, you spoke a word to me. You made a promise. God, that promise, I haven't seen it come to, to fulfillment. God, I haven't seen the end of that promise. And Lord, I'm at the place of Jabbok. Lord, I'm broken. I'm at a place of surrender. God, I'm at a place of desperation. Lord, 2020 was a crazy year. And Lord, here we stand in 2021. I'm not sure how things are going to go. But God, here we are. Here we are. I want to share, again, this is a sermon that came from a personal experience. And I shared a little bit of, of before. About 2019, um, you know, 20, 2019 for our family was just a, a real transition year, a crazy year. And so uh, I had lost a job because of a financial cutback. You know, d- just knew the Lord would, would open up a door for me quickly because who would not want to hire me, right? You might ever felt like that. Like, why can't I get a job? No one wants. Um, so there, there's, there's this months of struggle, months of, of Lord, what, what's going on here? And, and just searching. And, and, and I did everything I knew to do, like applied to every place there was. I tried to make it happen. I called people I hadn't talked to in years. Some of them, I'm not sure if they even knew who I was. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. And nothing. And then I started doing something. We, we had at our, at our home uh, back in South Carolina, we had maybe the, the highlight of our home was a, a covered patio that, that ran the length of our home in the back. It's like 50 feet, 50 by 15 covered patio. Um, we had a beautiful yard in the back, very secluded. And so it was a place of this being quiet, uh, a place we had shrubbery and trees and those things. And so I used to go out there every night, literally for months. And me and God wrestled. We, I mean, I, I know, and, and I'd use this story. I, I mean, I told God, I told God this. I said, God, you know that story of Jacob in the Bible? I said, Lord, it's all home between you and me. And I'm going to be out here every night until something happens, until there's a breakthrough, until, Lord... I'm going to hang on. I'm not going to let go. And God, you're going to be tired of me. And we're going to rest. We're just going at it. And so that's where this message comes from, of being in a place of, Lord, I need breakthrough. And God, I need breakthrough in a desperate way. And God, I'm, I'm tired of, of, of shallow prayers. Lord, I'm tired of, of trying to do things my way. And God, I'm at Jabbok, which is my backyard, on a porch. And Lord, we're just gonna we're gonna go at it until something happens. Until there's breakthrough, or Lord, you take me out. It, whatever comes first, this thing's on, Lord. And so uh, during that time, I had interviewed for another job, and we thought that was gonna work out. Uh, there was a consultant there at the interview, and, and uh, 
we're wrapping it up and, and they're joking about, can you start tomorrow and all these, and then we're just, breakthrough's coming. I know it is. Well, nothing happened. And so it was weeks and weeks and weeks of weeks of, of this struggle with God. And I continued to wrestle. And here's the thing, again, I'm from South, there's no G on the end, is our, our wrestling with God is not physical, but it's through fervent prayer. That's how we wrestle with God. It's through fervent prayer. Because there's no, there's no man showed up in my backyard. Nobody, poof, out of the blue, came up. There's no angels appeared to me on my porch. But I know God was there. He was there. And it was, sometimes I think maybe a physical battle would have been less strenuous. You know, would have been easier if, if some dude would have showed up and I could have just grabbed onto him. But it was me and God on that porch, and it was struggle through fervent prayer. It was the hard work. It was self examined because God gave it to me while I was on that porch. I held on, but boy, He did some work in me. You know, He, he gave me some too. It was a point of self examination. It's the point of saying, Lord, this is Jay Bach. I'm not going back. You've promised something. The, the, the promises for me was that God hadn't finished with me. Lord, you said. Lord, you promised. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There are promises in your life that God has given you that you know, that you know, that you know that the Lord has spoken to you, that it clears a bell. Now, there wasn't a ladder and angels going up and down from heaven, but you know that you encountered God, that you know that there's a promise on your life, that you know that God has spoken something to you, and it hasn't happened yet, and you're wondering why. And, and maybe you've gone through all kind of stuff, and you're at this place of decision. You're at this place of, of God. It, something's got to give. Am I been there? Something got has to give. Or I can't go on. And so I believe that's where Jacob was. Lord, something, something's going to happen here. And I'm not going to let go. And I love this uh, little, little thing that I found from Oswald Chambers. And he notes, prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Begin in prayer. Wrestle with God. Until you, you have that peace that passes all understanding. Prayer is, is, is the greater work. Don't stop until the blessing comes. Don't stop until the blessing comes. And I believe I'm in Katy, Texas, because I was at the J-Bock in 2019, and I wrestled with God. It, 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 it took a little while for the promise to come true, for God to, to finish out what he had started. But I knew that I knew that I knew that God had promised me something, and I knew that there was a breakthrough. And so I just said, Lord, you got it now. We, we have wrestled. We have fought. We have gone around and around. And God, you got it. So let's continue on through this passage of Scripture. Genesis 32 and 25. It says, Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And I believe that God could have eased, again, either this is an angel or the pre-incarnate Christ. Either one could have easily overcome Jacob, I believe, physically. If God wanted to crush Jacob, he could have done it. But I believe it was the process of the battle. God, God wasn't there to crush Jacob. He was there to transform him. And that's the same thing with us, that God will allow some of that. You know, God, the first night I went on my porch, 
And I see it in my head. I wish you guys could see it. There was a chair I would sit in. It, I had my spot. You know, the first night I went out there, God could have said, done. And answered my prayer. And sometimes he does that. I, I don't want you to think that breakthrough only comes through this wrestling with God. Because I believe you can come to an altar and somebody can pray with you and break through immediately. I believe you can be in your car going down the road praying, breakthrough. But I also believe there are times in our life that we come to the Jabbok, that God wants to do a deep work. He wants to do a, a transforming work that, that isn't a quick work because he's got to do some things in here on us. You know, it's, it's, it's the struggle it's, it's the battle. It's the fervent. It's, 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 and I don't know if God necessarily is saying this, but sometimes it's how bad do you want it? You know, we can do the bless me and help me and I can answer all your prayers and boom, it's done. But how, how bad do you want to hold on to me? And not let go. Hold on to the Lord. Not, not a bless me, shallow, but a Lord, you have said something to me. And God, this is where it happens here at the Jabbok. This is where it happens on my back porch. This is where it happens wherever your place of prayer is. Because God, God could have easily won that battle quickly, but he was doing something a greater work in Jacob. Now, David Wilkerson says this, one of the greatest miracles the Lord can perform on our behalf is to cripple all human efforts and make us totally dependent on him. You know that? I think that's why I touched his hip to remind him, you've struggled with me. Quit relying on the flesh. We, we've gone at it. We've battled. Don't rely on the flesh. You've been transformed. Let's keep going here. We're going to work our way through quickly. Genesis 32, 26 to 28. He said, let me go for the day breaks. But I said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no one be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. A name change. When Jacob reveals his name to God, God says, who are you? And he says, Jacob. Well, what does that mean? Deceiver, right? One who grasps the heel. His whole life he'd been called deceiver. His whole life he'd lived up to that. And he has an encounter. And God says, guess what? I'm not only going to touch you physically. I'm going to change your name. And some of you need a name change because that's an identity you have from your past. You get that? You need a name change. And that, that's something I believe the Lord just dropped in my spirit because I'm a, I'm a notes guy and that's not my notes. Is that some of you have been called something and you've taken on an identity. And when you encounter God... He's going to change that for you. That's good. Because you've been called something, and maybe you lived up to it. I don't know who this is for. You lived up to your name, but God wants to change your name. And it's through this fervent struggle at the Jabbok of, of pouring oneself out, of surrender. That God wants to say, you're, you've been this, but now you're going to be that. That God wants to say, I know what people have called you your whole life. I know what you've felt about yourself. But at the Jabbok, that's going to change. Because I'm going to give you a new name. And we see this in the Bible. <clears throat> as Abram becomes Abraham. As Saul becomes Paul. And how, how different places... God changes people's name. He's no longer Jacob. He's going to be called Israel. And if you look in the Bible, 
uh, and, and Pastor mentioned it Wednesday night, you do see where at times from this point forward he is called Jacob and sometimes he's called Israel. And there's times he kind of fell back into some patterns. But I believe the work that God wants to do is that when we have this encounter with him, there's no more falling back into the pattern. It is a completed work. And he goes from Jacob to Israel, which means prince, one who overcomes. Breakthrough is not cheap or easy. And when you leave that encounter, you should leave different. Verse 29 through 31 as we continue to work through here. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is that you ask about my name? And he, and he blessed him there. So jo- Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. He recognizes the supernatural element of the encounter. He leaves that place changed from Jacob to Israel. And God has done a great work in him. Now here, here as we close out this morning, here, here's kind of what I want to leave you with. And what I want to ask you, <clears throat> are we going to continue to pray those Bethel prayers of bless me, Lord, and never deal with the deeper issues that trans- transform us? Or are we going to be individuals and in a church that remain at the level of Bethel prayers? Bless me. If you do these things for me, God, then I'll, I'll help you out. Or are we going to be a people that meet God and say, Lord, there are promises that you have told us. God, there's things over the years that you've said to me. And Lord, I'm tired of those shallow and hollow prayers. You know, one thing I believe about 2020 is that, man, when we pray those type of prayers, they seem even more shallow now. When we pray prayers of this, this bless me, Lord, stuff, what does having lots of, of stuff mean if you don't have your health, you don't have your family, you don't have peace? And 2020 has kind of, again, hopefully focused our attention on what's important. The important thing is our relationship with the Lord. The important thing is those people that he has blessed us with in our life. And the important thing is the, the promises of God. The call that we had, that each of us have, those things that He has, has told us, because what He wants to do is fulfill those promises, not just for you, so that you can bless others, so that you have your testimony, so that you can make a difference. And so, again, are we going to pray those same Bethel prayers of "Bless me, Lord," and never deal with the deeper issues that transform us? Bethel was about convenience. The j is about surrender. In closing this morning, as, as we kind of land this thing, if musicians can come. And here's my question for you this morning. Are you ready to finally deal with those things that you've struggled with for years and never overcome and never have breakthrough? And it may be, these are serious stuff. It could be secret sin. It could be family issues, lost relatives, a job, finances, habits. It's those things that you know the Lord has spoken to you and has promised you. And maybe you've tried to deal with, but you've never experienced the breakthrough. I believe God's calling his people and his church to be radically transformed by the encounter with him. And just to get tired enough of saying, Lord, I'm I'm tired of the struggle. Lord, I'm tired of the same old, same old. God, I'm tired of these things in my life that I can't overcome and I can't seem to have breakthrough. Lord, Lord, I'm tired of, of not experiencing the promises of God that you've given me. And are you ready to grab hold of God and not let go 
until the blessing comes. Are you ready to say, Lord? I joked about Jacob sending all his stuff ahead of him. You go first. But there are times it needs to be God. I'm setting aside every distraction. And Lord, it's going to be me and you. It had to be just, just, just Jacob and the man. It couldn't have been all the people around him, all the distractions. It had to be Jacob and the man at that place of God, it's me and you. And there's deep issues and there's things that, that I just cannot continue. And I won't continue. And that's part of it. You got to say, I won't. God, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on and hold on until the breakthrough comes. Because God wants to, to do a work in us. He wants to fulfill. His, his word is yes and amen. So the promise that he has spoken to you is true. But he needs to get you into a place where you can receive the promise and walk in the promise. And sometimes that means dealing with some stuff. So the question today, are you, are you ready to hold on to God? Are you ready to get into the ring and say, Lord, it's me and you until breakthrough comes? If you'll bow your heads this morning, close your eyes for me. Just in this quiet moment, I want to I want to ask you this. If you're here this morning, you say, Lord, there, there have been areas of need and breakthrough in my life that I haven't experienced. But God, I'm tired. I'm tired of not seeing the breakthrough. God, I'm, I'm tired of those things that, that, God, you've promised to me and I haven't seen them come through. But Lord, I want to experience breakthrough. Bless me. If that's you this morning, if you'll just slip up your hand right, right at your seat. If there's areas you're saying, Lord, I'm going to grab hold and I'm not going to let go. God, it's going to be me and you until something breaks through. Me and you, Lord. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I appreciate the responses all over the congregation this morning. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray in this service. But I believe the, the, the greatest altar service will be you and God at your Jabbok. I'm going to pray today that God gives you strength. And that God helps you put aside distractions. And that you can find that place of you and God to find the breakthrough. Because here's what it'll do. It'll transform you. And it'll transform your family and your life and those that you're in contact with. The blessing's never just for you. It affects others. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you today. You got I, I know self-examination and surrender are, are not the easiest things to do. God, this, this doesn't sound like a, a lot of fun to to struggle in fervent prayer, to wrestle with you, to grab hold. Lord, we, we'd rather talk about bless me, Lord. Lord, give me stuff and, and make my life easy. But God, that, that doesn't transform us. So this morning, God, I, I pray for this congregation and these people. God, help them find that place without distraction that place of prayer help them find their Jabbok that place of crossing over that, that place where things won't be the same again that place that we encounter you in a deep and powerful way that transforms us and God I especially pray this morning I feel in my spirit to pray for, for the individual or individuals, the God that need the name change. God, they've been, 
They've been going by that name their whole life. And Lord, you want to change an identity today. Lord, you, you want to change how they view themselves. And so, Lord, even in this moment, I pray there will be some name changes from Jacob to Israel. Even in this place, Lord, that you would do that. God, that you would teach us not to, to rely on the flesh, to put our faith in you and your promises. Your promises are yes and amen. And God, I just pray for individuals in this church and this church as a whole, that, Lord, this would be a season of change and transition, a season of move, moving forward in your promises, that this would be a year of, of renewal and revival and a breakthrough. And God, we're going to do our part. Our part is to hold on to you and pray. And you're going to do your part. It's to bring breakthrough. Say, so God, we thank you for your faithfulness in the past. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the future. Lord, change us and transform us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. We're, we are going to receive communion this morning. If you do not have a communion element, if you'll raise your hand. If, if you don't, don't have one of the little cups, if you'll please raise your hand and a, an usher will get that to you. Keep your hands raised if you need one. There. Make sure that you have that. We want everyone to participate. I just want to say thank you this morning for, for your attentiveness and your, your willingness to, to hear God's word, and your willingness to respond. Because God has a call on you and has a great promise for your life. And there's breakthrough, so don't be discouraged. There is breakthrough. It may be at the end of a, a season of prayer but there is breakthrough. So have hope. Have hope for tomorrow. Amen. If you have your, your elements here, what we're going to partake in just a second. I want to read a passage of Scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. And communion is such a, a reverent and holy time. It's, it's a time for us to remember and a time for us to celebrate. Verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And verse 27 says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an, un in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. When I invite you to stand to your feet this morning as we prepare to receive. And, and one thing I remember as a, as a young person in my church, uh, before we took communion, and we took communion uh, fairly regularly, kind of like this church once a month. But I so appreciate my pastor emphasizing the 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 holiness of this moment, the reverence we should have. This isn't something we do lightly. This, this isn't just a ritual. It's, it's, it's a time of remembrance. I believe it's a time of fellowship with the Lord as we remember what he's done for us. 
And so what I want us to do just for a second, because again, the, the verse says it's, it's not something that we need to do without examining ourselves. So I'm going to ask you just for a brief second, if there's something in your life that you need to ask the Lord to forgive you of, there's no better time than these moments before we partake of communion. I believe also that communion is, a, is a, again, a powerful time of fellowship with the Lord. And I believe God in these moments can heal our body and can heal our mind as we remember what he has done for us. It's a powerful, holy moment. And so what I, what I want to ask today as Pastor Roger plays for just a second. If you'll take a moment to reflect, repent, and worship. To reflect, to repent, and worship. And then we're going to partake. As you have prepared your heart, if you'll take your, your little communion element, have it the bread side up, if you'll slowly and carefully peel back the tab there, it said the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and we had given things he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake of the body. If you'll flip your element over to the juice side. Again, be very careful and open that. You know, we have a new covenant with God. Our sins are, are forgiven. I believe our bodies are healed. It's the body and the blood of Christ. If you will, in remembrance of him. This is the cup, the new covenant of my blood. Do this, whatever you drink it, in remembrance of me. If you'll take the cup and drink. Let's pray. God, we, we, we pause in this holy moment. And Lord, we say we remember. We remember the price that you paid on the cross. A body broken, blood spilled. We remember the sacrifice. Lord, we also remember what that means for us. We know that that means the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. We know that there's healing power in the blood of Jesus. 
is restoration. There's a, there's a way now for a new covenant between God and man. And so God, today, we leave this place forgiven and I believe whole. And so Lord, thank you for the body and for the blood. Thank you for the victory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Before you go today, let me, let me I'm going to read a passage of scripture over you. But please take your communion elements. The ushers will be at the door. If you'll, you'll place your elements in the little trash bins for us, we appreciate that. Now, you've heard me say it every time I preach. One of, one of the things I love to do is to speak a passage of scripture over you and to bless you as you go. Because we have enough people that curse us sometimes and say things. But this is a place of blessing. And God's promises are yes and amen and true. And you, you walk in the blessing of God. Number 6, 24 through 26, very familiar. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Blessings to you. See you Wednesday night. God bless you again. Keep Pastor and Pastor Rebecca in your prayers as their own prayer uh, retreat this week.